So I'm pleased to be able to be chatting today with uh, Pippin Norris, who is the Paul F. McGuire Lecturer in Comparative Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and she's also the director of the Electoral Integrity Project. And uh, we're talking to uh, Pippa today because of the work that she's been doing recently about populism and uh, in a broad comparative perspective. So I thought maybe we could begin, Pippa, by having you describe so a little bit about your background and and the path that you took towards studying comparative democracies. So it's a pleasure, Mike, to talk to you as ever and to uh, have a little bit of background to the book which I did with my colleague Ron Inglehart, Cultural Backlash. So I, got, I kind of got into this years ago, of course, um, because I cover lots of different areas and they have some things in common. I always say I don't focus on a particular subfield, if you look at APSA, I can go to many of the different sections. What I have in common in all the different areas I work on is I'm problem oriented. So I'm looking at a controversy, at a debate, uh, something going on which has real world impact, but also academic uh, debates as well. I try to use empirical evidence, mainly from surveys, but not only. I also use institutional evidence like VDEM uh, or the Electoral Integrity Project data. Um, and I also use mixed methods. So I like cases where appropriate and qualitative in-depth studies, um, as well as the survey work. And people often know me from one thing or another. So I started in gender politics. That was my first area of interest and my first book. And then I focused on comparative elections. And then that na led naturally into the study of parties and issues of, say, political recruitment, and then issues of democratization and um, and then issues of political communication and religion, and now most recently, populism. So many different topics. So well, starting with the work on elections and democracies, when when we think about that area and, and the work that is essentially survey-based, the term populism has taken on a new meaning in the past 40 years or so what we could really think of as a political generation. How, how did that happen? So the work which was earliest was really very much Latin America. I think they pioneered because, of course, they went through the experience so deeply of populism uh, in the early period. Since then, what's happened is that Western Europeans have taken this up and scholars who focused on a range of different parties, obviously National Front, National Rally with Marine Le Pen in France, uh, but also in many other countries as well. We've seen the rise of populist parties in Austria with the Freedom Party, in the Netherlands with Geert Wilder, in also Central and Eastern Europe with, with places like Fidesz, uh, parties like Fidesz and Viktor Orban and so on. So what's happened is that the work has expanded naturally into a comparative context, but I think it's still very much dominated by case studies and it's still often dominated in our concepts of, of, of populism and the way that we try to measure it in our surveys by our own national experiences. So the comparative work globally has, I think, lagged behind. And that's an area that I think really is developing in very exciting ways for survey measures, but also for measures of parties and other measures of populism. Um, and so our empirics are kind of catching up with the reality of what's changing in politics um, and in party politics in particular. And of course, the immense impetus for this has also been Trump in America, calling attention to American scholars on this and new developments in our measurements and our concepts um, in the United States. But again, as I say, it's still a work in progress. And so uh, American scholars in particular often think back to the tradition of populism in America um, at the turn of the century. Uh, European scholars still think in terms of what they term, quote, radical right populism, which I think is a phrase that we should abandon increasingly. Latin American scholars thinking a bit in terms of economic policies and charismatic leadership. Um, and then we have populism in many other countries, Modi in India, for example, right now with Trump, but also Duterte in the Philippines, arguably, um, we can argue about Russia and, and, and Putin there. So things are expanding and our concepts, I think, are sharpening somewhat, but our measures are still in the hopper. It, it's still a matter of big debates. And then the big questions, of course, are causes and consequences. Causes, we're getting a handle on. Why is there the rise of populism in so many countries? Consequences is still very much work in progress, in part because we have to see 
when populists rise to government, when they get in as coalition partners or as the major party, what the consequences could be for a range of different issues, civic culture, political institutions, and of course, liberal democracy. So your, your early work in this area was based upon uh, cross-national surveys of citizens' attitudes. What, what yeah. did you learn from this work about populism and uh, how populism manifests itself in the number of Western democracies? So the very first work was 10 years ago called Radical Right. And at that time, I was looking in particular at the ways in which we could think about supply, which is how far populist um, parties take advantage of political dissatisfaction, protests, and try to uh, exploit in particular anti-immigrant uh, attitudes. Then you have demand, which is the public, and there one I'm looking at issues of how far the public supports populism, which is different to um, social conservatism and notions of authoritarianism, and how we can sort out uh, that, and how those two things interact within an institutional context. So three different factors. Since then, um, I've moved into the area much more of populism rather than radical right parties. And so the book, which I did with my colleague Ron Inglehart at the University of Michigan, um, tries to really address the drivers in the light of Trump, in the light of Brexit, and in the light of what we term the rise of authoritarian populism. So if I can just kind of clarify what we're, we're thinking with our ideas, populism is really a rhetoric. It's not so much an ideology because it isn't a set of worked out ideas, which is kind of coherent. It's not like socialism or liberalism. What it has is two core claims and, pop, and populists can come from across the political spectrum. So you can have mainstream candidates. I argue, for example, that President Macron in France is a populist, but very centrist. You can have those who are on the right, as many European studies are looking at, AFD in Germany, National Rally in France, um, Five Star Movement potentially in Italy. Um, and then you also have populists who are on what's conventionally seen as the left, who are in favour of social conservative views, but left-wing economic policies, i.e. a strong welfare state, high level of state intervention. So when you think about it in that way, we kind of get out of the old ways of thinking about it. And populism makes two claims. One, that you can't trust the establishment. You can't trust, that means, elected politicians, parliaments and Congress, because they're seen as dishonest or corrupt. You can't trust judges because they're seen as partisan or biased. You can't trust the media because they're seen as fake. You can't trust civic society organizations and big business and corporations. That's where, for example, um, Bernie Sanders gets a lot of his rhetoric about billionaire classes and so on. So on the one hand, populists basically have a rhetoric which says, don't trust them, don't trust those who are in power. On the other hand, they say legitimate decisions Legitimate authority comes from the people. Now, the people is very eclectic. It can be defined in different ways. The boundaries can be different in different places. But the idea here is, in a sense, that liberal democracy is being challenged by ideas of, and visions of direct democracy. The problem is there aren't many mechanisms of direct democracy. There are referendums. And as we saw in, in the Brexit case in Britain, when there, there was a referendum which voted just barely to leave, but where Westminster politicians disagreed, the argument was Brexit means Brexit, the referendum, the majority view, even if it's only 52%, the one that counts. In many countries, however, there is no mechanism for direct decision making, of course. And so what you get is the rise of strong men leaders with authoritarian values, which really can uh, play up on, on this rhetoric and use it to dismantle some of the core ideas of legitimacy in liberal democracy. And so people lose faith in the conventional parties in the opponents and in um, the main institutions like the independence of the law or the rule of law or the role of the free media and the press and strong men leaders uh, can come to power. And again, just to be clear, clear, when we talk about authoritarian, there's two main meanings of that. One is a type of regime uh, which we can think of classically opposed to liberal democracy. The other, though, is going right back to the 1950s, and it's our ideas of authoritarian values, and, and they go right back to the idea of the authoritarian personality, although we don't use personality in our, in our book. But we certainly say that what happens is that populist leaders can exploit authoritarian values in the public. That is to say, a sense of insecurity, 
feeling that there are threats out there which are out to get us, that there are problems in particular for our group and our group identity, that there are under threat by uh, a variety of social trends or enemies or people who don't agree with our views. You identify an enemy that is the out group. If we're under threat, then it's us and them. And again, the them can be many different groups. We think in America in terms of race, in Europe, we think in terms of immigrants, but in many other places, you can have other groups who are seen as equally problematic and threatening to your set of values. So it could be, for example, gays and homosexuality, or it could be women who are a threat, or it could be Muslims in Islamophobia, and increasingly uh, the revival of uh, anti-Semitism. So the group is under threat, and the threat is coming from them, and a strong man leader is willing to step in to speak on behalf of that group, on behalf of that group which feels under threat. And so when you put together authoritarian populism, that for us is the biggest risk to liberal democracy. Populism per se, in some ways, doesn't pose that threat. It can be progressive, it can be ones which shares egalitarian values and ones which are fairly liberal towards minorities and so on. But when it has that combination of authoritarianism which basically um, undercuts social tolerance and social trust and populism as a language which can increase uh, the support for that, that's where you get the, the, the risks, I think, to liberal democracy. Um, and it's most extreme, by the way, in not in established democracies like in America, although clearly there are fundamental problems here, but mainly in those countries which are electoral democracies, meaning they've come through free and some some level of free and fair elections, but the elections haven't been consolidated and other institutions are often weak, like the independent courts or the free press or um, the, op the opponents. And in those contexts, that's where you get the uh, backsliding in democracy that we see in many countries around the world. So our vision is that populism is, is at the heart of this is rhetoric. Then you add in the values that we can measure through the um, World Value Survey or any of the other studies that we've got, and we can start to gauge popular support for this new phenomenon. So the, the term backlash, you know, implies uh, being against something. That's uh, right. Is the backlash against the status quo, the current political system, or how do you think yeah. of that? So the backlash is a concept that I think is very powerful, hasn't yet been quite capture, captured through our evidence. The argument here is that it goes back to Ron's early work. We know that for decades now, since the 60s and 70s, there's been the rise of social liberalism, meaning a wide range of different attitudes that were in a very small group in the 1960s and 70s. They were the educated, they were the young, and it was a more tolerant view towards um, gender ideas of, uh, and, and sexuality. Uh, secularization versus religion, an idea of cosmopolitanism versus nationalism, an idea of environmentalism as being a critical aspect versus material growth. So these values, which Ron predicted, were ones that started with the younger, well-educated generation. And what's happened, we argue, is that over the years, the population has shifted as that group who acquired their values in early years and in their formative years has expanded in the population as the interwar generation has gradually declined. So you see the rise of social liberalism, exemplified by an issue like gay marriage, wasn't even talked about 15, 20 years ago, and is now on the books in many countries around the world. So those values have increased, and they've increased particularly amongst the young, and those who hold those values from the early years, and amongst the educated, and amongst those who are living in urban areas that are highly diverse, and many other characteristics which uh, this group shares. So that's the long term trend. That's basically the silent revolution playing its way out. And it is demographic, it's compositional. If you think about the size of the groups, those who are holding those social values versus those who are socially conservative, who believe in religion, who believe in patriotism, who believe in nationalism, who believe in, in a vision that's a very different set of values about marriage and the family. So our thesis about the tipping point and the cultural backlash is that when social conservatives feel that they're under threat, that they were the 80% of the population, their values were held throughout America, but gradually they feel that they've lost out. They've lost out in terms of the elites, for example, Hollywood values, the values of the medium, the values in Congress, 
the values of the educated groups, the values in universities, all of those have moved in a more liberal direction. And when you become 50 percent or you become the 48 percent or the 45 percent, which, of course, is more or less where Trump's base is. And it's more or less uh, around the 48 percent where the vote leave was in Britain. When you become that new minority and you've lost your hegemonic status and your values are seriously under threat, it's not just that you're being told they're under threat, they really are because things are not moving in your direction. You're on the wrong side of history. Then you start to get angry. Then you start to feel that you're not being represented in the media or in pol politics. Uh, politics is not for you. They're not talking your language. They're going in a very different direction. And so the progressives have gained over the years through, through these trends. But the conservatives have lost out very sharply. And especially when you're still at 45 percent, say, of the population and you still hold those conservative values, you're big enough to have an impact on politics, particularly because we're talking about a big age gap and the groups who are most conservative in nearly every country remain those who are the older groups, those who are the interwar generations, those who are the most progressive or liberals tend to be the younger groups and the older groups vote. So they can still turn out in very large numbers. Young people are now reacting to this. They realize that they didn't vote in the past in anything like the same numbers. The disparity we've known about voting turnout by generation for years and years. So in 2018, for example, in America, young people certainly increased their, their, their willingness to vote and to be registered and they got active and they mobilized and we've seen the massive protests. Trouble is that their views are still underrepresented as a majority in America because the, el the older groups are going to vote at far higher numbers. So that group of social conservatives is declining in the population as a share of the population. They're still at a balance, at a tipping point in the electorate. And as a result, you can get, as we have in America, in a majoritarian system in particular, a president who comes in with a minority of the popular vote, as we know, but a clear majority of the electoral college vote comes into power in a very radical way, only appeals to his base, does not try to expand his base, uh, but appeals to them on these socially conservative values, which is very much the, the issues that people who are support him are concerned about. And that gives him sufficient support to be able to be a minority president in a majoritarian country. And the same can be seen in, in many other countries where, again, populists have risen to power. Now, that's not always the case. Obviously, in many places, in some, they still remain very much a small group. But, they're in, but, but this group is mobilizing, they're organizing, and the parties have, uh, we estimate, uh, more or less uh, doubled their share of the vote just since the 1960s. Um, and it's been going up more radically. And once they get that platform, once that group becomes mobilized as a party, once their leaders start to organize, then that also allows um, a bigger debate and it, it also polarizes the other side. So that's why we see that first, for example, in the Republican Party again in America, things started to change, remember, with the Tea Party well before Trump. Uh, and that was the first manifestation, although you could even go back to Perot in a way. But you can see how that group becomes increasingly dissatisfied. They dragged the rest of the party, the GOP, further to the conservative right. And as a result, they're quite a long way away from the median voter in America, but they're still sufficiently organized, they're sufficiently mobilized, they're sufficiently enthusiastic, they can still win an election. And particularly when uh, they're overrepresented through um, the Electoral College and also through the ways that, as we know, the um, Electoral College works in terms of rural states, uh, they can still uh, win. Particularly, of course, if the other side is, is fragmented. So um, that, that's, a, that's a situation, that's our big picture about what's going on. And we started our work actually well before Trump was elected. The first thing we wrote about this that was an article uh, which has been widely used is a um, working paper at the Kennedy School that came out in July 2016, just after Brexit and just before the November election, essentially. We made these sorts of predictions about some of the developments that we thought were happening and then what's happened since then is that's expanded into a book which has focused cultural backlash on the European evidence by and large and the American evidence. And now what I'm doing is taking these ideas more globally 
and seeing whether or not we can see similar patterns in many developing countries. And for that, we're waiting for the next wave of the World Value Survey, European Value Survey, Wave 7, coming out in July, which is going to cover something like 100 countries with survey data, where we can look at those who are supporting populist and authoritarian values and, uh, and really get to grips with, is our explanation in liberal democracies also true in, say, Venezuela, also true in Russia, also true in Thailand, also true in the Philippines, also true in many parts of the developing world, where there are many who hold fairly traditional values, of course, and who also hold authoritarian values and, um, and who are, see the appeal of populism as something that's really um, something that they can vote for. In, uh, in your book, The, the Cultural Backlash, uh, I'm going to make a specific reference to figure 2-1, which is the theoretical framework for the book. Yes. And, and you describe uh, the way that demand side values and supply side institutions uh, interact to produce this kind of phenomenon. Can you say a little bit more about those concepts? Yes, I mean, it's really important mainly because we often come at it from one angle or another without seeing the interaction. So if we think of it like a marketplace, we obviously have the demand side, which is in the public, the electorate. What are their values? What are their beliefs? What do they think about democracy? What do they think about uh, social tolerance? What are their values in terms of the priorities for the country? What's their attitudes? And all of those things are broad, broad developments. And the changes we've just described were the ones about changes in the mass electorate. Then, of course, what matters is also what the rules are, what the rules of the game for translating public preferences into electoral outcomes. And that depends on fa factors like the electoral system. As we mentioned, if we had a popular vote in America for the presidency versus an electoral college vote, then Hillary Clinton would be in the White House and we might not have written our book. If we'd had a, a wide range of other institutional practices, uh, for example, if there wasn't gerrymandering in, in constituencies so that parties could only appeal to their base, if there wasn't uh, campaign funding rules in America so that money can play a big role, if there wasn't um, a wide range of other institutional contexts, including a majoritarian electoral system, then we might have a very different outcome uh, based on the, the changes in the electorate that we talked about. So when we look about countries worldwide, we often try to deduce the popular support for for these types of parties from their share of votes and seats. But that's a mistake. In a sense, we have to think that we have both the demand, which is going on, then we have a mechanical filter, which turns popular demands into outcomes. And that determines who gets into parliaments, who gets into Congress, who gets into governments, who gets ministerial office, and therefore into the actual power, which allows them to affect the government themselves. So the rules of the game are absolutely critical give you different rules and you get a very different outcome for um, the public policy making process and how uh, those parties uh, have an impact on the uh, on, on the outcome. And just to give you a very quick example, um, again, from the British Brexit context, since that's been in the news so much, we think about there what we've had is under a first past the post electoral system, just like in America, uh, what matters is winning the seats, which means that small parties tend to get nowhere. However, what happened was that Nigel Farage came along and he was very willing both to create new parties, first the UKIP party and then the Brexit party. And they were always very small in terms of their share of support. They moved up when it came to electoral elections for Europe because they could make um, grounds there. But in a Westminster election, they couldn't. What, what happened, however, is that although a small party, they were seen to be popular in the polls. And they really impacted the big parties, the Conservative Party under uh, Boris Johnson that became populist as well. And, and, and under the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn moved in a populist direction on the left. And so both major parties adopted some of the core um, values that uh, this very small party had been advocating. Um, and even though that party got nowhere in terms of seats, they had a tremendous impact on the agenda and on the decision ultimately that Britain left the EU, um, which happened um, just very recently. 
So the rules of the game matters. And in your more recent work, you have now turned to an analysis of political rhetoric and party pronouncements of various kinds. How, how did that project develop? So in our book for Cultural Backlash, what we used was the Chapel Hill Expert Survey to try to identify parties which had populist um, rhetoric and parties which had different sets of values. And the Chess study is an excellent study which is done by colleagues, but it's limited to European countries at present. Uh, there are some plans to go into Latin America, but by and large, most of the parties that we could compare from that are based in Western Europe and some in Eastern Europe as well. So there are two measures in that which we used for our book. One is, does the party, um, is it important for them on a 10 point scale uh, to be anti-elite and also to be anti-corruption? So those are two elements that we used and we classified lots of different European parties and then we matched those parties with the European um, Social Survey in order to look at the electorate who supported those parties. But that is only limited to one, one set of countries and one region of the world. And it also wasn't a very good measure of populism in retrospect. So what I've done most recently, and it's only just been released, is uh, do something called the Global Party Survey. And it's an expert survey. And this is following the methods which many people have used before. The methods, in fact, were started in the mid 80s with Peter Mayer. And the idea is that you ask experts who are scholars, who have written about parties and elections in all the countries around the world, how they see parties on a variety of different 10 point scales. And we have uh, 21 items in the survey, the expert survey. And it comes up for every expert to say, um, in this country, for your expertise, where would you place the parties on this scale, that scale, or the other scale? Um, and so we measure basically party positions on political ideology, which is where do you place them on the left and right? Where do you place them on liberal conservatism? And then where do you place them also on the use of either populist or pluralist rhetoric? So that's the first measure that we've got, which is a really effective, consistent measure, systematic measure. And we cover over a thousand parties in 163 countries around the world. And again, nobody's tried it on this scale before. Uh, we had the experts already in our database um, because I've worked for the Electoral Integrity Project since 2012, and we've created a whole uh, over 10,000 experts in our database. And we got responses from the questionnaire from 1,800. So for every country that's included, we can ask them, how do you place the party, the top 10 parties in your countries in terms of these ideological values and then in terms of particular issues so we ask them about how do you place them on things like environmental protection how do you place them in terms about tax cuts versus spending uh, how do you place them in terms of things like ethnic minority rights or immigration and then the final section also asks more questions about populist rhetoric for example Cass Muda uh, defines populism in terms of um, how far they're about the will of the people so we, or versus uh, politicians. So we ask five or six other measures about populism that people can use. And then what you can do, which is really a breakthrough, I think, is to link the new data set, which has only just been released, with all the other survey data sets which are available on a cross-national basis. So we've incorporated standard codes. So if you want to look, for example, in the World Value Survey, the Cumulative World Value Survey has over 100 countries, and it's always asked, how did you vote? So by matching the expert position of the parties on all of these items against the um, data in the World Value Survey, which now has over 330,000 respondents, then what you can start to do is really say, OK, so the parties which are most populous or the parties which are most left wing or the parties which are most conservative, what's their characteristics amongst their supporters who voted for them, whether they're the social characteristics like age, class or race or gender whether they're the attitudes and the values behind that, uh, or whether there are other aspects, for example, attitudes towards democracy or attitudes towards um, how far you've protested or engaged yourself in, in, in voting turnout, et cetera, et cetera. So multi-level analysis, I think, is really an exciting area where we can use survey data, but it's essential to put the survey data both in conjunction with the parties that they're voting for, so we don't just look at the attitudes, we look at the attitudes versus the position of the parties, and then, we also look at the national level, it's a three level analysis.
So you can look at the characteristics of the country. Is it democratic or not? What's the regime? Is it presidential? Is it parliamentary? Does it have first past the post? Does it have a, a PR system? Then you can look at the parties. And if you think about it like Russian dolls, you've got the individual voter within the context of the party they support, within the context of their country and the institutions, um, which all of those things are embedded in. And I think that people are, I've already found it's amazing. I only put the data set on Dataverse uh, about um, eight days ago now. I've already had 500 downloads of the, of the files because there are so many people wanting to understand populism and so many people who want to work on parties, so many people who want to be able to uh, really push forward this set of analysis in their own country, in their region, or on a particular issue. And we just have not had the um, straw to make the bricks so far. And the new GPS, I'll just add to finish off here, um, is robust. We also include measures to see whether or not the new estimates that we have for over a thousand parties are consistent with previous estimates, for example, of the left-right position of parties. And when we test that, we can only do it for, uh, by and large, parties in Western Europe, because we haven't got previous estimates around the world. But when we do that, we find a really high correlation. So even though, for example, the CHES study is conducted independently of the global party survey, when we look at the correlations between their estimates of where the parties are on left-right scales and liberal conservative scales, versus our estimates using the same questions, we find correlations in the in the region of 0.80 and above, sometimes 0.90, um, which given the vagaries of expert surveys is really, I think, pretty remarkable. So I think for the first time, we can start to really look at populism as a global phenomenon, and we can incorporate that to really understand, for example, in the comparative study of electoral systems or in the European Social Survey, or in any of the other, for example, the global barometers, we can start to think about how people voted, not just as individuals, but as individuals within a party position, and then within a party position within a country. And the research agenda is enormous in this field. And the um, global party survey was only done in November, um, but I've cleaned it up, uh, and my assistant has in the last couple of months. We've just released it, so it's as up-to-date as you can get. Um, are all the, am I confident about all the estimates? No, I'm not, in particular in some countries. For example, in authoritarian states, you have very few experts in parties and elections who are either able or willing to participate. So we might have only, say, four or five experts. In many developing countries in Africa and in Asia, um, there might be very few respondents who are willing to give us their view about how the parties are arrayed. The parties themselves might not be well institutionalized, meaning they don't necessarily have a strong and consistent ideology or set of values or positions. It depends on the leader who comes to power. And so they're, they're not really stable party systems in, or party values in that sense. But um, for the first time, what we've really done is taken the methods that have been there since the 80s of expert surveys on party positions and also applied this not just to issue positions, but to rhetoric and gone more broad and gone um, across more countries and more parties than anybody's done before. So I hope that people will use the new data. I think they certainly will from all the reaction we've had um, and that others will try to replicate our methods as well. So that again, we have further robustness tests. The more people do this, the better the uh, confidence I'll have that the estimates we have for um, smaller parties in difficult countries to get access to are really accurate estimates that we can rely upon. In this uh, most recent report that you prepared on this project, uh, in, in uh, figure eight, you have a fourfold table in which you look at left and right wing economic values and conservative and liberal social values. That's right. And the vast majority of the entries are uh, for parties with conservative social values, uh, even though they're about equally split in terms of their economic values. That's right. Um, why do you why do you think you found that most of the parties have conservative uh, social values? So when we're looking at the parties which are the strongest in populism, and we're looking at liberal democracies, what you find is that, as you say, most of them are in the top right quadrant. They're on the right, 
in terms of being more or less free market in, in their economic values, but also highly socially conservative when it comes to things like um, nationalism, nativism, anti-immigration, um, restrictions on, on gender equality and, 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 and minority rights, and also issues of um, religion, for example, in Hungary and so on. So that's the pattern which is quite consistent. Um, and I do think that that's, that's uh, something which is um, reflecting so much of the literature, which is called radical right. But the other things we found, two other things, number one is that there are parties who are in the opposite quadrant. And all one needs to think about is that we might have an election in America between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, both of whom are very populist by the newest evidence we have from the pilot study for the American National Election Study, where we ask all sorts of questions there, which are really interesting on populism. We find the supporters of both, both candidates are remarkably similar in populism, but they totally differ in their other values. Um, so obviously Bernie Sanders is much more liberal on, on, on all of the uh, social issues, as well as being uh, more socialist towards the economic issues. So parties do exist in both quadrants. And if we go more broad to uh, electoral democracies, what you find is you get more or less um, parties across each of the four different quadrants. So you get parties who are on the left, but who are socially conservative. And for example, the Polish uh, Law and Justice Party will be an example. There, there are many others. You get parties which are to some extent libertarian. There are a few which are in that quadrant as well, although again, not that many. In other words, they want a free market and they want no intervention on the social agenda. But also again, you get the other two quadrants are equally populated. So this dispels the notion that populism equals radical right. It doesn't. It's often clustered there. Those values go together with populism. For some of the reasons I think we just described in our book and our theory in our book, it's those who are socially conservative who feel most under threat by the liberal trends and they go towards a more populist solution. Um, and it's the social conservatism, not the economic uh, free markets, which is where they feel the threat, because that's the big change in, in recent decades. Uh, but there are parties in all the quadrants which are populist, and therefore we need to understand the contrast between them and where they're similar and where they differ. And they differ in their social values, although they agree in populism. And the antithesis to populism is an interesting question. What's the opposite? What's the antithesis? Well, for, for us, what we're labeling it is, is an idea of pluralism. So populist, uh, as we said, it's anti-establishment and it's pro the people. So it can be democratic in a broad sense, but it also often relies on strong leaders. Against that, we can see pluralism, which is really about um, checks and balances on the executive. It's about rule of law constraining their powers decisions. It's about minority rights and other rights and human rights in general. Uh, and it's about uh, a wide range of different ideas for how to govern. So populists, pluralists differ sharply on those basic rules of the game. And, and we also think that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to come to any accommodation. It's not like most policy issues. If you can't agree on the rules of the game, uh, then you can't agree on how to proceed and how to move forward. And that's very much the crisis of legitimacy that I think we're experiencing in America and we've experienced in other countries as well. So for researchers who are not from the most frequently studied Western democracies, what suggestions would you make for studying the cultural backlash in their own setting, thinking about what kinds of data they might collect or, or other kinds of research avenues they might pursue? Well, this is one of the great things about the World Value Survey. Um, we're in the middle of fi finalizing it now. And so we've obviously been going since 1981 for the first wave. The latest wave is in conjunction between the European Value Survey and the World Value Survey. And we think that when the data is released in July in the Lisbon IPSA, we should have about 100 countries in the latest wave. And so this covers everywhere around the world, basically. Um, we're not as good as we should be in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we've expanded in MENA, we cover most of Latin America, we cover large parts of Central and Eastern Europe and Asia as, as well. Especially in particular, the larger countries are the ones which have always been in the, in the world, world value since the very early days. So in the past, it's been quite difficult to use the World Value Survey to study issues of populism or to study issues of party support. There are, without getting into it, party codes. And we always ask, how, do, how would you, which party would you support? Which party would you vote for? But it's complicated in the past to really try to understand. There are lots of different parties 
always different party names. You don't know how to label them. You don't know how to categorize them. You don't know what values they have. What we're going to be doing is also incorporating in the release, not just the individual level survey data, but also some data about the parties drawn from the global party survey, and also some metadata about the country, basic things like levels of democracy in VDEM or levels of economic development from the World Bank or uh, regional or cultural uh, aspects like religiosity and so on that will be there. So just as I described earlier of three level analysis, the World Value Survey is going to give us the largest data set. And I would really encourage people to use it on a comparative basis. So much of the work that we do with the World Values remains a study of Tunisia, a study of Egypt, a study of Brazil, a study of Russia. But of course, it's actually designed at best to work across a region. And I think that the skills are increasing in many of the younger generation of, of social science scholars around the world. Uh, that's very much to be applauded and encouraged. And what we need is people from the region who are very familiar with the actual politics and what, what the issues are, what the culture is, what the people are, to really use these data sets uh, and exploit them much more fully. And the more that we can make it easily available, which we're trying to do uh, through a variety of different mechanisms right now, the more that we can make it user friendly so that every student can pick it up. And they can go online without knowing R, without knowing Stata, without knowing SPSS or anything else, but they can actually get those bar charts, those graphs, those maps, those cross tabulations, and those regressions of those countries or regions they want to look at, then the more this data is not going to be in a small group of academics sitting in the Western countries, but is actually going to be something which is a resource for every country and for policymakers and practitioners, uh, as well as for scholars and uh, students as well. So I think there's a lot, there's so much to be done. And there really is. And um, I think that the new data is being collected and will be released. And then it requires good ideas, good theories, uh, openness to testing, uh, to really think about alternative explanations in different regions and different regimes and in different parts of the world. Well, I have uh, one final question for you. Uh, you, in your recent work, are um, quoted as believing that contemporary democracies can regain their political equilibrium in another 30 years. Do you think of that as an optimistic statement or a pessimistic statement? And why would that be? I'm not sure why why, why I was quoted for that, because I don't quite believe that. Um, to be honest, what was people are always coming to me and saying, OK, cultural backlash, we get the argument, we understand cultural change is leading to these big developments, disruption of party politics. What do we do? And we identify four solutions or four optional strategies, if you like, that politicians, parties and policymakers and civic society organizers can, can think about. Um, but whether or not they're implemented and how you implement them, we really don't know. So one option is just to do what social democrats and liberals always do, which is to kind of do more of it. So what should the Democrats do, for example, against a populist like Trump? Well, we talk about healthcare, and we talk about economic opportunity, and we move to the left, try and talk about redistribution and taxes and things like that. That's comfortable ground for liberals and progressives, but it's not clear that that's actually going to address the problem. If the problem isn't economic, and there's overwhelming evidence in our book and others that it isn't economic per se, then the solutions can't be economic. It just doesn't fit. On the other hand, one could think about the issues which is motivating some of these um, support for populism. One could think about immigration, for example, and one could think about issues of um, changing social values. Can those who are on the progressive side in any way accommodate any of those issues? Can they be sympathetic to them? Can they think about issues of nationalism as opposed to cosmopolitanism and so on? Here, I think there is some limited room, but so far there's no evidence that Many parties on the left or the liberal side are really thinking about this hard. Again, there could be a conversation, for example, in the Democratic Party about immigration, which does say, let's think about some other models in Canada. Let's think about some other models in Australia. Let's think about some other models in Germany. And what might be ways that we might want to think about changing or reforming some of the ways that we think about um, immigration whilst being highly tolerant of people's rights especially of refugees, especially of those who are being persecuted back home. 
And if the liberal left, if the progressives could think about immigration policy and have a conversation, then that might address some of the concerns about some of those who say, I'm sorry, this is a critical issue for us in our state or whatever, and we need to therefore go to Trump. However, it's incredibly difficult for progressives to do that because it goes against or because again it goes against some of their own social values to even have that open discussion it's very sensitive as a, as a topic and there is intolerance and authoritarianism on the progressive side as well as on the um, conservative side and so even the mention for example of, of reforming immigration rights can be see, you, you can just be shouted down as a result so those are very difficult issues, but nevertheless may be important. A third solution is just to wait and to say, well, look, in the long term, if our thesis is right, then social conservatives are going to go down, ultimately through demographic change in the long term. And in the long term, liberals are going to increase as a proportion of the electorate. If your values are from your youth, you keep going. The trouble is that in the time it would take, an awful lot of other things can change. And in particular, the institutions can be really damaged so heavily uh, and you can't go backwards. Um, if, for example, we know that public confidence in American elections has gone down dramatically. Gallup World Poll, it was about 50 percent 10 years ago. Now it's about 30 percent and it's going to go down further, I would predict, given that both sides now have an incentive to question the institutions. And you can see so many other things which are going on, which are damaging, damaging institutions, such as confidence in rule of law such as public trust in Congress and so on. So in the long term, it's entirely possible that uh, the population shifts continue, the value changes continue, but because we're so polarized and because the institutional consequences are, are, so, are so long term, um, it seems easier, it's rather like Humpty Dumpty, it seems easier to break liberal democracy than it does to rebuild it back up. Um, so there are some scenarios, if you like, about where we might go. So far, if we look at the best evidence, and I use the variety of democracy evidence as my best indicators nowadays of the strength of democracy, how it's changing, what you can normally see is that um, most liberal democracies kind of plateau. They're not increasing in their levels of democracy, nor the institutions strengthening, nor are they greatly diminishing, by and large. But electoral democracies, which are that category further down, the type of regimes which haven't consolidated, they're the ones which are most vulnerable they're the ones where freedom of the press is under attack. They're the ones where rule of law and partisan judges have really uh, changed people's, uh, changed the way the institutions work. Those are the places where, again, with elections, electoral integrity is most sharply under threat. You think about a Hungary, you think about a Venezuela. Those are the countries where executive powers have expanded. And you can think about so many different cases of that um, and where the basic principles, the norms of, of liberal democracy, as Steve Levitsky argues in his book, the norms are what's being undermined and then the institutions kind of collapse in on themselves somewhat in those, those countries. Is it going to happen in America? We can't say. It's too, it's too chicken little to claim that everything is going wrong in America. Um, you can see certain signs of democratic strength. For example, the number of people have mobilized, who've become active, the number of people have demonstrated is at record levels. So you, you have a, a radical president who is trying to change things with a minority support, still minority if you look at the most recent polls, still at around 42%, 45% maximum. You have the majority population, which is sharply against that in terms of most social trends. You look at um, uh, support for a wide range of different social values. And the trouble, of course, is that the uh, opposition to Trump is so fragmented right now that there is no standard bearer. And in, in the absence of any cohesion, in the absence of agreement on the liberal progressive side, then, of course, the minority can still prevail if they're united and they're going to support their candidate. <coughs> so I wouldn't say in any way that in another 30 years everything's going to come rosy and we're all going to be fine and everything. It's not a cyclical, it's not an automatically cyclical phenomena. But um, we'll have to see how things develop in this election and in the next 10, 15, 20 years before we can have any confidence in any sort of uh, prognostication about the health of liberal democracy.
Well, I want to thank you, Pippa, for this uh, conversation. It's been a great treat to sit here and uh, speak with you. And also to thank you on behalf of Waypor for contributing your time for the conversation. A pleasure, Mike. And really, Waypor is such a great organization. And the more that we can uh, expand some of the uses of this cross-national data and think about new ways of, of, of doing it to really reinvigorate some of the issues we've always looked at, I think the better it's going to be. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you again.